This Halloween, I wanted to do something special. I thought it'd be fun to cover the true story behind something scary. But after starting to look for some movies to fit the bill, I quickly realized most of the scary movies that claim to be based on a true story also require a belief in something extraordinary, something supernatural. Then, just a couple weeks ago, I heard an interview with Ben Mesrick. Ben is the author of over a dozen books, including Bringing Down the House, which later was adapted for the movie 21, and The Accidental Billionaires, which is the book that Aaron Sorkin adapted for the screen in The Social Network. In Ben's interview, he was speaking about his most recent book called The 37th Parallel. This book covers something a bit different than a bunch of MIT students taking on Vegas casinos or the founding of Facebook. It covers UFOs. I'm paraphrasing here, but Ben said one of the main reasons he deviated from his normal topics to write about something so out there was because he was fascinated by the fact that any time the topic of UFOs comes up, people instantly discount it as untrue. No ifs, ands, or buts. As soon as the term UFO comes up, it's laughed off as fiction. And yet, as Ben points out, for many people, these paranormal experiences are as real as the stories you and I will be sharing with our families at Thanksgiving next month. So Ben decided to challenge the status quo and write about it. This got me thinking of the very first story we covered on this show. Do you remember? It was the story of Hugh Glass, the real man who inspired the Revenant. Hugh survived a crazy bear attack followed by extraordinary conditions in nature time and time again. But no one else was around to confirm his unbelievable tale. He may not have had a reason to lie, but does that stop people from stretching the truth a bit just to make the tale seem like a better one? Or even a more recent story like Argo, which is based on the telling of Tony Mendez, a retired CIA agent who claimed to be there just a few decades ago. But it was a top secret mission, so we're relying heavily on Tony not bending the truth and telling his tale. For any story, really, how do we know they're not just making it up? People will do some amazing things just to get their 15 minutes of fame. While I'm not trying to say Hugh Glass or Tony Mendez lied about their tales, I merely want to point out that all stories require a bit of faith. We must first believe in those who lived through the tale. Although, I'll be completely honest and upfront when I say I'm skeptical of tales involving ghosts and hauntings, but I'll also be the first to admit there's a lot about the world that I don't know. Like Ben Mesrick, I'm fascinated by stories that many people so quickly dismiss as fiction without so much as a second thought. Why is one person's word any better or worse than any others? Why do we openly believe the stories we see on the mainstream media like CNN, Fox, or NBC, and yet dismiss the stories of others? especially since we all know the mainstream media isn't always entirely truthful themselves. If you're like me and you're skeptical of the supernatural, I'm not asking you to start believing. All I'm asking is that we both give those who lived through these events the same credit we've given others with fantastic tales, such as Hugh Glass, Tony Mendez, or any others you hear recount their stories each and every day. We may not believe in the paranormal, but those who are telling the stories believe them to be true. So I'm asking you to suspend your skepticism, and I will do the same, even if it be for the next few minutes. Some stories are simply strange, and we don't know the truth. The only thing we do know is what those who lived through the events claim to have happened. Or do we? Is there some other documented fact that's being left out? With all of this in mind, and in the spirit of Halloween, let's dive into the tales that inspired Hollywood's The Conjuring. I'm Dan Lefebvre, and this is based on a true story. Now before we dive into this week's episode, I want to let you know that next weekend, on Saturday, November 5th, I'll be taking part in the Extra Life Charity. If you're not familiar with Extra Life, think of it sort of like one of those charity walks, except instead of raising money by walking, I'll be raising money by playing video games. And that's where you come in. If you can, please consider donating. The money goes to a great cause. It's the Children's Miracle Network Hospitals and it's completely tax deductible. So what's to lose? Hop over to basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash extra life to learn how you can donate, whether it's a dollar, $10, or really whatever you can afford to help the kids. And if you can't donate, 
please help me spread the word by sharing that link with your family and friends or on your social networks. And then on Saturday, you can follow my gaming exploits as I stream live on Twitch. So again, that's based on a true story podcast.com slash extra life. And there you can learn more, donate to extra life or find the Twitch link to watch me live stream on Saturday, November 5th. I'll make sure to put that link in the show notes. So thanks in advance, and I look forward to seeing you on Saturday. The movie starts off in a small apartment owned by two nurses by the name of Debbie and Camilla, played by Morgana Bridgers and Amy Tipton, respectively. We learn their story as the two, along with her fiancé, are explaining the story of a doll to Ed and Lorraine Warren. In the film, Ed is portrayed by Patrick Wilson, and Lorraine Warren is played by Vera Farmiga. According to Debbie and Camilla, the doll's name is Annabelle because it was possessed by the ghost of a girl named Annabelle Higgins. The girls gave Annabelle permission to enter the doll, but it's not just any doll, it's the kind of doll that has a face only Hollywood could love. And according to Ed and Lorraine, it's not possessed by a ghost, but by a demonic entity. The Warrens take the doll and place it in their Connecticut home, which contains many other possessed and supernatural items. All of this is based on an actual case that Ed and Lorraine Warren worked. The doll wasn't nearly as creepy, though. In reality, the Annabelle doll is a typical Raggedy Ann doll, so it doesn't look very scary. Sadly, Ed Warren passed at the age of 79 in 2006, so he never saw The Conjuring. But much of Ed's accounts of the conversation portrayed at the beginning of the film seemed to be true. The owners of the doll were two nursing students, just like in The Conjuring. And just like in the movie, the Warrens claim the Annabelle doll did start off by doing little things. One of the students would notice it in one position in a room of the apartment, leave and come back to find it in a different position or another part of the apartment. And there were messages lying around the apartment. They didn't say, miss me, though, like in the movie, but rather they said even more creepy things like, help us and help Lou. Now, Lou isn't credited in the film, but the boy sitting next to the two nurses in the beginning was Joshua Blount, who is credited as simply college student. And since Lou was one of the nursing student's fiancés, that's most likely him. So that's definitely pretty scary. A raggedy end doll who's just leaving messages around the apartment? Yeah, creepy. Here's where I should mention a fairly important aspect that many doubters have pointed out. We only have Ed and Lorraine's word for this. Oh, it's true that the Warrens have an actual raggedy end doll locked up that they say is the Annabelle doll. You can find photos of it online. Or you can visit the Warrens' former home in Monroe, Connecticut, which is now a museum, and see it in person. But many critics point out that there's been no other proof of what the Warrens claim the Annabelle doll did. We have to take Ed and Lorraine at their word. Back in the movie, the text that scrolls after being introduced to Annabelle claims that Lorraine is a clairvoyant, and Ed is the world's only demonologist recognized by the Catholic Church that isn't already an ordained priest. It would seem that the Warrens are the perfect pair to take on the supernatural. Once again, though, we have to take their word for it. If Ed is recognized by the Catholic Church, the Church certainly isn't saying it, which in and of itself seems a little odd that Ed claimed to have been recognized by the Church, and yet the Church doesn't seem to recognize that. In fact, while many people do claim that Ed was indeed recognized as a demonologist by the Church, when you start to peel back the sources, you'll find that the only source seems to originate from Ed himself. It seems to be the case of one side claiming something and the other simply not claiming anything. Except in this case, many others have taken up Ed's torch and started claiming that he was recognized on his behalf. While this is my own speculation, because we simply don't know the original source if there's anything other than Ed, it's likely that this is all referring to something that happened after William Blatty released his book, The Exorcist, in 1971. The numbers didn't reduce in 1973 when the film of the same name was a smash hit. When this happened, there was an influx of people wanting the church to perform exorcisms. Tons of requests came pouring in through the 70s and 80s. The church didn't have enough priests to handle all of the requests, and most of them were simply ignored. 
But priests are human, and as humans, it's really hard to turn down requests when people are essentially throwing money your way in exchange for your services. So a lot of priests would secretly perform exorcisms without the church's official recognition. One of these priests was named Father Robert McKenna, and he performed many exorcisms with the Warrens. So perhaps this is the recognition of the Catholic Church that's being referred to? We don't really know, but when he was interviewed by Michael W. Cuneo for his book, American Exorcism, Father McKenna said of the Warrens that their books are sensationalized and you just can't take it literally. And then he went on to say that he doesn't want to even be publicly associated with them. So it would seem even the priests that worked with the Warrens didn't want to be associated with them. And so it's not too far of a stretch to think that if a rogue priest didn't want to be associated with them, the church as a whole probably didn't either. Of course, this is all speculation. Since Ed has passed and unfortunately the Catholic Church didn't reply to my emails, we probably won't know anytime soon, if at all. Back in the movie, after being introduced to Annabelle and the Warrens, the movie cuts to the Perrin family arriving at their new home. The parents' home was located in Harrisville, Rhode Island. Harrisville is about 20 miles northwest of Providence, which is the capital of Rhode Island. That's also about 60 miles southwest of Boston, Massachusetts, just for reference there. It's set on 200 acres of land, and the home itself was an old farmhouse built in 1736. While I haven't visited the house personally to count them, some reports claim the house has 10 rooms while others say 14. Regardless, it's safe to say the Harrisville home gave the large Perrin family plenty of space. So it's easy to see why Roger and Carolyn would want to move there with their five daughters. The parents consist of Roger and Carolyn along with their five children, Andrea, Nancy, Cindy, Christine, and April. The actors portraying the Perrin family in the film are Ron Livingston as Roger and Lily Taylor as Carolyn. The children are played by Shanley Caswell as Andrea, Haley McFarlane as Nancy, Joey King as Christine, the role of Cindy is being played by Mackenzie Foy, and finally, Little April is played by Kyla Deaver. As you probably could have guessed, the Perrin family definitely is real. And the characters are all real, all seven of them in the family. In fact, most of the Perrin family were involved in the making of The Conjuring, and the producer of the film took advantage of this when marketing the movie. After The Conjuring was released, Andrea recounted one of the moments from when the family was moving into the house. Andrea recalled, and I quote, I walked in with the box from the truck, and I greeted a gentleman that was standing in the dining room. He ignored me as if I was a ghost. Both sisters saw him too, the two that followed me in. And the third walked into the kitchen and said, That man in the dining room just disappeared. That was our first encounter, end quote. So it would seem as if the house was haunted from the beginning. In their first night in the movie, the children are playing a game of hide and clap when they stumble upon an old cellar that's being boarded up. While we don't know if the children actually discovered the cellar in this way, the parents' home did have that cellar, according to Carolyn at least, and it filled the family with a sense of dread. But then... Dark and dusty cellars filled with cobwebs tend to give off that kind of vibe. In the movie, things start to get creepy right away. The morning after finding the cellar, poor Sadie, the family dog, is found dead outside by little April. Then, that evening, Nancy and Christine are in bed when Christine's foot gets pulled by something off screen. Like the Annabelle doll, things are starting off slowly. Just a few days later, the two girls are sleeping when Christine's blankets are torn off. It wakes her up, and she's frozen in fear when Nancy wakes up. Christine can't speak, but she points. There's something behind the door, she manages to say. And then, of course, in Hollywood horror fashion, she gets up, Nancy, that is, gets up to investigate. After a moment's pause, both girls scream, causing the parents to come running in and flip on the light. All of these reports are true. Well, at least they're true according to Christine and Nancy. As you might expect for something occurring in the two girls' room at night, no one else was there, so we don't really have any other word to go off of. But there is one key point to make here, and that is that the movie makes it seem like all of these events happened in a pretty short timeline. There's not a lot of time passing between the parents moving into the home at the beginning of the film and then moving out at the end. So 
While the movie's date of 1971 is correct for the parents moving in, in truth, the Perrin family lived in the old farmhouse for nine years, from 1971 to 1980. And according to the kids, this sort of taunting and terrifying event took place all the time. So these events in the movie here aren't really actual events that anyone can prove, but more an amalgamation of a number of events as told by the Perrin family. Desperate for help, soon after this is when Roger and Carolyn reach out for help in the movie, they find the Warrens at Massachusetts Western University in Wakefield, Massachusetts, and convince them to help. Now, just as a quick side note here, I couldn't find any Massachusetts Western University when researching this episode. Try searching for Massachusetts Western University on Google. Be sure to put the quotes around it just to get those exact words in that order instead of the results of any of the words, Massachusetts, Western, or University. The only mentions are people quoting this part from The Conjuring. I suppose maybe it had a different name in the 1970s, but it still seems very odd that there's absolutely no mention of it online. So my conclusion here is that this is made up for the film. And if you're able to find something, please let me know and I'll make sure to update everyone here on the show. Back in the movie, Ed and Lorraine make their first visit to the parents' home and right away, Lorraine sees dark spirits latched onto the family. They recommend an exorcism. But to do this, they'll need to provide evidence to get the church to approve it. So that's what they need to do, gather proof. Again, this timeline is very sped up. According to the Warrens, at first they thought the ghosts in the parents' home were harmless. For example, one of the apparitions the parents would see was a woman sweeping the kitchen. Nothing really came of this ghost, but periodically they'd find their broom had been moved to a different spot and a neat pile of dirt sitting in the middle of the floor. Not all of the ghosts did the chores for the parents, though. In the movie, the youngest girl, April Perrin, makes friends with a little boy named Rory. According to the film, Rory used to live in the home before being murdered by his mother. The crime was committed at the demand of a witch named Bathsheba. Well, as you might imagine, when you live in a home that was built in the early 1700s, there's bound to be quite a lot of history. And with a lot of history comes the chance that some of it was not so great. Now, according to the real Perrin family, one of the spirits that the young girls befriended was someone they believed to be the ghost of a boy named Johnny Arnold. But for some reason, they called the ghost Mandy. The Arnold family was one of the first owners of the home. There are stories that circulate claiming Johnny took his own life by hanging himself in the attic of the home in the 1700s. Still other reports claim young Johnny's mother hung herself at the age of 93 in the barn. And yet other reports claim one of the Arnold children, Prudence, was raped and murdered at the age of 11. Then the stories claim local authorities ended up charging a farmhand with the crimes. We see these sort of reports being uncovered by the Warrens in the movie, and sure enough, these are the things the Warrens claim to have uncovered in their real investigation. As the Warrens are doing their research behind the history of the home in the movie, they find that Bathsheba was one of the original owners of the home and laid a curse on anyone who owned it after her. Just like in the movie, the real Ed and Lorraine Warren claim to have looked into the history of the parents' home. I say claimed because the results don't really match with history. For example, if they had truly spent so much time researching the story, they must have read a book called The Black Book of Burrillville. That's an old book filled with odd deaths in the area, so surely if the story the Warrens claimed were true, Bathsheba would have been in there. And yet, she wasn't. That begs the question, did they go into their investigation looking for answers? Or did they go into the investigation with answers looking for a story to back up those answers? And what really happened? Bathsheba Sherman was a real person, and most of those stories that the movie mentions do exist now. By that, I mean there are stories that people have claimed are real for a long time before The Conjuring was released. However, just because a story exists doesn't make it historically accurate. The truth is, we don't know what exactly the Warrens uncovered in their research. We only know the stories that they claimed to find. And these stories are different than what the historical documents say actually happened. While the movie wasn't the first to make these claims, its popularity didn't help uncover the truth. 
In the movie, the story is that Bathsheba killed her own child just before hanging herself and laying a curse on the property. And that's what kicks off all of the evil supernatural events that we see on screen. This part of the movie is based on claims that the body of one of Bathsheba's children was found to have a hole in its skull, almost as if a needle had been thrust into the child's head. According to the story, local authorities charged Bathsheba with manslaughter and rumors started to stir that she was a witch. While the movie may have been based on stories that are floating out there, it's those stories that aren't true. In fact, none of the claims of witchcraft or of her murdering her own children or anyone else are true. The stories of Bathsheba being a witch were made up by people in the present day trying to find a shred of truth, just enough to build a story on. Since she was a real person who just happened to live a few miles from Massachusetts just a few decades after the Salem Witch Trials in the 1690s, it sounds like something that could happen, right? Except it didn't. Oh, and that whole thing about the clocks stopping at 3.07 a.m. because that's when Bathsheba hung herself, also not true. But it sure makes for a spooky story. One of the historians who uncovered the truth behind Bathsheba is Jamie Rubio, who has a great article on her site that goes into some of the claims against Bathsheba. Jamie has done extensive research into the documentation, newspaper clippings of the time, and other historical documents and performing interviews. Her findings tell a completely different story than what we see in The Conjuring. Prudence Arnold wasn't raped and murdered at the old Arnold estate. Bathsheba didn't hang herself like the movie claims, but rather died on May 25, 1885 from paralysis due to a stroke. The local newspaper then offered a nicely worded obituary, not really something you'd expect for someone supposedly thought of as a witch. The stories the movie are based on have just enough truth to make it seem correct at first glance. There's real people like Bathsheba and real places like the old Arnold estate. Jamie's book called Stories of the Forgotten, Infamous, Famous, and Unremembered offers some great, well-researched documentation on the real history. I'll make sure to put a link to Jamie's article and book in the show notes. For The Conjuring, it's fairly obvious that most of these little details and facts were filled in for the sake of the film. Where many believe there to be seemingly random dots, they were masterfully connected together to tell a terrifying tale on the big screen. As the film starts to climax, a bunch of things happen that, well, didn't really happen in real life. For example, in the movie, a couple more of the prominent ghosts are Rory and Mrs. Walker. According to the film, Rory was killed by his possessed mother, Mrs. Walker. Then she hung herself after realizing what she'd done. In the movie, Carolyn meets the ghostly Mrs. Walker in the old cellar. In truth, there's no record of Mrs. Walker in any of these events at the farmhouse. This particular story was most likely based on the legend of Johnny Arnold and then his mother Susan who hung herself in the barn, which we learned about earlier. Of course, this isn't true either. But that didn't stop the story from growing. And that's really what a lot of the movie's ending is based on. Stories that have been made up and then passed on and extrapolated. Everything in the movie comes to a happy ending when Ed Warren ends up doing an exorcism of the house on his own. Well, he's helped by Lorraine and Roger Perrin, but Ed does the exorcism of Carolyn without the help of a Catholic priest. It works just in time for the sun to rise. As the parents stumble out of the house, Ed and Lorraine look on to see the family that they've restored. It's a happy ending. As we learn in the beginning, the timeline was extremely rushed in the film. What seems to take just a few days, in truth, was years. The parents lived in the old farmhouse until 1980, nine years after they moved in. Everything in the movie boils down to whether or not you believe the only witnesses who claim to have been there, namely the Warrens and the parents. When the movie was released, the Perrin family swore that the events in The Conjuring were true. According to Andrea, The Conjuring, quote, is a fair reflection of the chaos and danger we faced at the farm, end quote. Andrea even wrote a three-part series of books about her family's experiences in their home. The series is called House of Darkness, House of Light, and you can find them for sale online. Unfortunately for believers of the events in The Conjuring, a major blow to credibility happened when it came to light that the Amityville Horror, another of Ed and Lorraine's cases that turned into a Hollywood blockbuster, was revealed to be a hoax. According to Snopes.com, quote, The history of the Amityville Horror, as with The Exorcist, began with a best-selling novel. 
a book entitled The Amityville Horror, A True Story, written by Jay Anson, was published in 1977 and quickly scaled the sales charts. Anson was not a resident of the infamous possessed house, but a professional writer hired to pen a book based on supposedly true events that had taken place there several years earlier, end quote. The Amityville case involved the Lutz family, and just like the Perrin family, after the Warrens were called in, everything seemed to be okay afterward. No one living in the Amityville home since these supposed events have ever claimed anything happening. And the same is true for the old Arnold estate in Harrisville, Rhode Island. In 1988, shortly after the Perrin family moved out, the Sutcliffe family moved into the old Arnold estate. And they lived in the old home peacefully until 2013. All of that changed when The Conjuring was released. In an interview, Norma Sutcliffe, one of the current owners, said, We haven't slept in days. We wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and there are people with flashlights in our yard. Norma and her husband have reported that they've never seen any ghosts or hauntings in their 25 years in the home since the parents moved out and The Conjuring was released. But ever since the movie came out, they've lost their privacy. And according to Norma, even Andrea Perrin has had regrets writing her books about the hauntings. Norma explained this in an interview with a website named The Call. This is affecting us physically and emotionally, and I don't know how long we can take it. All it takes is one crazy to do something. There are already threats in the internet that wouldn't it be fun to break into the house? Our barn is very vulnerable, and there is a big story connected to the barn about supposed hangings. In the end, and as I've reiterated throughout this entire episode, any story relies heavily on belief of those who claim to have lived through or witnessed the events instead of the historical documentation and facts. For the spooky story behind The Conjuring, that means believing Ed and Lorraine Warren, as well as the Perrin family. Well, do you? This episode of Based on a True Story was written and produced by me, Dan Lefebvre. As we've learned, there's not much fact behind The Conjuring, at least not the kind of fact that we can prove with documented history. But there are some captivating tales nonetheless, and with the season of Halloween, it can make for a great story, regardless of whether or not you believe them to be true. To learn more about these events, I would recommend picking up Jamie Rubio's book called Stories of the Forgotten, Infamous, Famous, and Unremembered. In it, you'll learn the true story of what really happened. Or if you're just looking for a spooky tale, regardless of accuracy, you can pick up Andrea's three-book series called House of Darkness, House of Light. Each book is about 500 pages long, so it provides a fairly accurate recounting of the parent family's claims. Thanks for listening to the Based on a True Story podcast. If you want to go behind the true story, you can sign up for the show's newsletter and find all of our other episodes at the show's home on the web at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. And don't forget, you can support the show by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash based on a true story podcast. Patrons of the show will get an exclusive peek into the creation of each episode and a heads up for future episodes before they're released. Plus, when you sign up to be a patron of the show, you'll get the warm, fuzzy feeling of knowing that your monetary support helps me keep the lights on and keep the show going. And if you've made it this far into the show, I would really love to hear your thoughts on The Conjuring. Do you believe the events are true? Why or why not? You can chat with me about it on Facebook over at facebook.com slash based on a true story podcast, or you can get in touch with me directly on Twitter at Dan Lefeb, D-A-N-L-E-F-E-B. Finally, I'd like to thank my daughter for creating the creepy music and sound effects that you hear behind this episode. So from my family to yours, have a very safe and happy Halloween. Halloween.